everybody. Thank you for tuning in to Performance Anxiety on the Pantheon Podcast Network. My name is Mark and I'm your host. I want to thank our sponsor, AKG, for sending us their Podcaster Essentials Kit. It has an incredible Lyra microphone and the best set of headphones that I've ever used. If you've ever thought about starting your own podcast, this is the best, most affordable way to get started with it. Justin Greaves of Cripple Black Phoenix joins the podcast family this week. Not only do we talk about Cripple Black Phoenix, its formation, its troubles, its resurrection, and the new album, we go even further back. We go back past Electric Wizard, past Armor of God, past Hard to Swallow, and even past Iron Monkey. We go all the way back to Justin's dad's record shop and how that informed his desire to create music that he hadn't heard yet. We do discuss all those bands and more, so don't worry. And Justin's cat Fang joins us for a bit while we talk about Crippled Black Phoenix being Punk Floyd, Gravity Bikes, and we create new genres of music like Doom Disappointment. Follow Crippled Black Phoenix on Facebook and Instagram at CBP underscore 444. Follow us at Performance ANX on all the socials. Coffee from ko-fi.com slash performance anxiety is always appreciated. Merch can be found at performanceanx.threadless.com. And as always, review, rate, and subscribe. It really helps us reach more people. Now let's get on with the show with Justin Greaves of Cripple Black Phoenix on Performance Anxiety, part of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Well, uh, you're listening to uh, me, Justin Greaves, and uh, I'm talking to my buddy Mark on uh, Performance Anxiety, and, you know, we're chatting about music and film and life in general and uh yeah okay ride bikes and be good <laughs> no yeah that's whatever that's it that's cool if you can use that use that thank you so much man this is uh this is really awesome i've been listening to cripple black phoenix for ever oh. <laughs> well no accounting for taste. <laughs> <laughs> so you fit right into this podcast. All right. Nice. You got the feel for it already. <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll, tell, I'll tell you now, I've got two Bengal cats here and they're, they're nuts. So you, you probably see and hear a lot of shouting and stuff. So. No problem. No problem. My dog makes a cameo every once in a while, but he's in the kitchen. So, uh, so nice. he's, well, I want to, before we get, started really i do want to thank Susie stapleton for getting us connected yeah she was awesome and i really do appreciate her connecting me with you and i thank you for joining me today uh it's no problem yeah it's uh yeah nice nice of uh Susie to hook it up as well yeah so, she was a lot of know, fun out of the blue yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was uh, uh, definitely a character uh, it's funny because uh, when she uh she come to the studio when i was doing ellen geist and uh yeah, I mean, her, her and Belinda got on like a house on fire because oh, awesome. they're both completely nuts. And, you know, <laughs> Belinda's like a mongrel. She's got like Croatian parents. She's a Swedish citizen. Oh, wow. But she's actually, but she's actually born in Australia. Oh, wow. But, yeah. So, you know, she's a real <laughs> mongrel. But the Australian connection, I think it was the, you know, real set them off. So. That is awesome. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, they had a good time. When I started going back ah. and listening to Cripple Black Phoenix again, I'm like, man, Belinda's just awesome. I got to go <laughs> and start digging deep into her stuff now. Yeah, I mean, she's, she's, she does have a backstory and history as well, you know? Yeah. I mean, she's, she's actually, she's been with, with Cripple Black Phoenix. I mean, she's, she was on Crafty Ape. So, I mean, that was 2011 when we recorded that. So, wow. God. That's, that's the first time she did something with us, you know? Um, but then, because obviously me and her are an item, you know? Mm -hmm. So we, didn't, we, at first, I mean, we're not really keen on sort of mixing personal relationships and, and, and what we do, like, you know, music that makes and sense. everything. Yeah. And Belinda had kind of retired from music anyway at that point. Ah. Yeah. It's, I mean, we've all had bad experiences through our lives in the music industry. I mean, it can be pretty shit at times, you know? Yeah. So... She, she'd gone through that, you know, she'd gone through a kind of hate phase, I guess. And, uh, but then we started doing Say the Land, you know? Yeah. Which was, uh, you know, we did a couple of albums on Case Code and stuff. And then 
she she came on tour with CBP, but she would never come on tour if she wasn't doing something. So she came and sold merch so she could get make a bit of pocket money, you know. Oh, okay. But she she would never come to hang out. <laughs> she, she, she she always said she doesn't want to come and hang out with bands. She's not into that. But if okay. if she was working, if she if we were paying her for something, then she'd come, you know. Yeah. So she came and she was doing the merch, and then when she was doing the merch, she got up on stage and did a couple of songs that she'd done on like you know Crafty Ape or oh, whatever. Wow. And then it sort of developed from there, and then she did a couple more songs, and the next album she did a couple of songs, and it basically she, it sort of it sort of grew. She grew back into it, and she grew into she kind of grew into the band. Oh, that's I mean, I I consider that Belinda's been part of CBP since 2011. I, I go right back to where she did the first vocal session with us. You know, so well, I mean, that makes yeah. sense. I mean, at that point, if she's been a cons uh, like a consistent part that whole time, yeah. yeah. But she's been like, I mean, she's one of the longest serving members of the band, you know. I mean, yeah. she's she's more, and obviously she's more family, you know. Yeah, I think that I think that gets missed sometimes, you know. I mean, of course, I'm biased because it's she's my partner, but yeah. she's not in the band because of that. Right, right, right. We were, we, you know, that came much later. And yeah. We actually, we actually tried to steer away from it, from it for for a long time. But the oh. thing is, you know. We both do it. We both love doing it. We're both in the same things. I mean, and then it's just in the end, you just think we're too old and lazy to even bother trying to trying to be something or trying not to be something. Right. Let's just do what we let's just do what we want, you know. Yeah, exactly. You don't have to answer to anybody, really. No, exactly, I mean, exactly. You... So, uh, and I'm and I think CBP have totally benefited from Belinda doing more because. Especially on the new stuff, she's really stepped up a game. I mean, she's like another level now, you know, <laughs> which is great for us. It's great, great for her, but great for us. You yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey, cat. <laughs> this is Fangs, by the way. Oh, wow. Hey, Fangs. Wow, beautiful yeah. cat. Yeah, I might have to um, shut him out in a bit, though, because he, he gets really impatient when he wants to go for it, because I have to take him for a walk. Oh, really? On a harness, yeah, because they're not outdoor cats. Ah. Uh, because uh, they're Bengals, you see. Okay. Um, if, he get, if he gets really annoying, I'll just put him out for a little while. <laughs> no problem. Have, like, an hour. So how did, I want to know how you got into music in the first place. I know you actually have quite an unusual history, and, and I guess... Uh, origin story if we're going to go superhero type of thing as far as music is concerned you, you you grew up in your dad owned a record store yeah yeah basically i grew up in a record shop that's, that's great yeah i'm assuming but is that what really sparked your love of music in the first place uh i mean there's music in the family you know okay um so so i think i was probably born sort of predisposed kind of like you know i've always been a sort of um I different think differently. I'm left-handed. I'm a, I'm into art. I'm into music. You know, yeah. I didn't do well academically at school, but I did well at creative things. You know, so that's the, obviously I'm that kind of person anyway, without even choosing to be. And my first performance was like when I was about ten years old, and and I borrowed my, one of my dad's drums and and I played along with some Adam and the Ants for a school assembly. You oh. know? <laughs> Oh man, that's pretty good. I mean, Adam and the, Adam yeah, and the so, ants. Well, yeah, it's it, everything's down to Adam and the ants. That's that's what made, that's what made me want to be a drummer. Really? Yeah, that's why I started. You know, I've been a drummer for most of my life. It's only because I only started playing guitar when I did Cripple Black Phoenix. Really? Yeah, yeah, and and it was just out of necessity, you know, to write my own songs, and then I ended up playing on stage. You know, when we play live, I play guitar now, so I've turned into a guitarist. Well, I'm not, I'm not a guitarist. I'll tell you now, I am no guitarist. I'm the dude that plays guitar. Because <laughs> you, you play in an unusual fashion. I mean, you're you're left-handed, but you play right-handed. Yeah, which means I have a, a little bit like bit janky kind of style of playing. You know, I tend to play a lot of chords that are unresolved. Oh. Um, so I kind of play half the chord, but leave the rest of the the strings open. But then I don't, I don't tune the strings into a chord. I just have like standard tuning, concert pitch, standard tuning. Wow. Because uh, maybe it's like a little bit like an e e easy kind of trick to do when you when you tune, okay, tune into a chord. Because then you're just like, no, 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 you know, <laughs> up and down. It, it doesn't seem very challenging to me. <laughs> anyway, I digress. No, I'm a drummer. <laughs> so, so I, I'm assuming was 
drums the first instrument you you took up then yeah drums and then then I, then I was playing bass when I was a teenager played in a couple of local punk bands and playing bass still playing drums and then I, I basically I suppose I cut my teeth really I went through I went through all kinds of hell on playing drums with bands you know oh really uh, that, was, that was my first professional kind of things you know going on tour and putting out albums and yeah. You know, and then actually getting paid for when when bands used to get paid for playing gigs. You yeah, know? <laughs> way um, back when, huh? <laughs> yeah, there, there was a there was a time where I was like, you know, I could pay my rent. <laughs> yeah. So I, I heard a story that uh, when you were a kid, your dad actually made you listen to some prog rock. <laughs> kind of. So, it's kind of kind of true. How, so how did you get into that? And was there like a quiz at the end or something? He gave you a box and said, all right, <laughs> there'd be a test at the no, end of the week? I mean, no, I think I think because my dad's so easy going, really, you know. Um, and see, when I was younger, he, he, he used to bring home like seven inch singles and things like that. And I was always allowed to listen to whatever I wanted, whatever kind of music I wanted to listen to, I was allowed nice. to listen to, uh, which was amazing. I'm so lucky. Oh, yeah. So really, before anything, I was really like a very young punk rocker. Yeah. Oh. Because my sister, was, my sister was like four years older than me. She was hanging out with the local goths and punks. Yeah. You know? Oh. Um, and I helped my dad decorate the shop one time, and and he said I could have any album I wanted from the shop as as a payment. You know. Okay. So of course I went for the fluorescent <laughs> yellow cover of Nevermind the Bollocks. Yeah. <laughs> so. I was I was never the biggest Sex Pistols fan, but that that was like my introduction into punk rock, and I went s straight into like the more hardcore. Oh punk rock. wow! So I must have really like you know because when I was really young, it was like Adam and the Ants. It's kind of heavy drumming, you know. I like oh, yeah. that very heavy stuff, you know. So then it was like punk rock, and then it was Motorhead and Venom, and it was it was Discharge, it was all that kind of stuff. Okay, and then obviously thrash metal came along and yeah. it was like oh you know i digress but yeah when i was listening to a lot of punk my dad did he, he had a box of vinyl and it was things like um i mean it's like iron maiden and, and things like that but yeah there was also deep purple and demon and, and and things like that um and pink floyd obviously and you know it's it was a really eclectic taste and it was really good you know when it's like kind of 70s the really good stuff yeah yeah and he just said, yeah, work your way through that, have a listen, you know. And wow. of, of course, the darker darker stuff like Pink Floyd or the heavier stuff like Demon or whatever, you know, at that point in my life, even though it's not heavy, it seemed it at it's, the time. Yeah, it really did. Like, you listen to old Iron Maiden, and, and, I, and I remember my parents hating it, you know, like, no, I don't want that in my house kind of thing. And then you listen to it now, and I'm like, that's really mm. nothing comparatively speaking. I mean... Yeah, I mean, I, I remember like driving my sister mad by playing Venom, you know, really loud. Yeah, you know, so it, it goes. So it must have made an impression on me back then. Even I didn't even realize it. I, but, uh, man. it oh. actually, that it reminds me of the little stories that, that um, I had uh, some product that Sex Pistols kind of thing they did after, you know, oh, whatever, okay. and it had. Uh, can you remember the song "You Silly Thing"? I don't. You know, it kind of goes, oh, you silly thing, you've really gone and done it now. Oh, Anyway, okay. there's a line in there where it says, hi, boys, I'm the chosen one, can't you fucking see? <laughs> right? Right. And it was like, oh, it's just it's so rebellious. Anyway, I was like 10 or 11 years old. I was just on my way up to the secondary school. But I took a tape recorder, a little, well, it was a portable tape recorder, but in them days it was still like this big. Yeah, I had one of those. Um, yeah, and I used to play it on the bus. Anyway, I was in the <laughs> playground playing this bit, and I kept playing this song because it had swearing in it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it got confiscated. I got caught, and I was taken to the headmistress. Oh. They called my dad, right? So my dad had to come all the way from town, you know, half an hour drive. Oh. I was in the, in the playground, and I saw him go into the, the school. A few minutes later, he came out. My dad just walked past me and winked, right? And apparently, I find out years later that my dad, he didn't care what I was listening to. They were trying to get, you know, they were telling me I'm in trouble for listening to this horrible thing. Right. My dad didn't care about that. 
but he gave the headmistress a bollocking for dragging him all the way from work for that. <laughs> oh, I love you. Like, yeah, obviously, I didn't know. I didn't know this until years later, you know. Oh, is... <laughs> yeah. You dead. I mean, how cool, how cool is that? You know? Oh, your dad's the best. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So that was kind of, you know, that's, that's how I grew up, you know, so I could basically listen to stuff. I had access to it as well, which is an amazing thing, you know. Very lucky to have um, the, the kind of record shop is like, very much like a rock shop but we did we did do the charts and the pop stuff as well obviously yeah because it's on high street shop you know yeah but it was very much like very alternative punk hard you know hard rock it sounds you know yeah i mean it sounds like if you you know you're telling me you're bringing what he's bringing home for you to listen to it sounds like it was an incredible shop i would have loved it it was i miss it a lot actually Uh, he closed in 2007 and it was a the typical story of like, well, at first it was the, the, the major chain stalls. They came and went, but he survived. Then it was the supermarkets with all their super cheap deals with the major labels. Oh, wow. And he still had, and they had to compete with that. And then you get the internet. Yep. And he survived for a, for a good while. He survived for about maybe t- almost 10 years with the, with the internet stuff. By the time it got to streaming... You know, 2000, 2006, 2007, when that started. Yeah. That basically finished it off. That and finished off a lot. Got, yeah. And the other thing is that the town center as well, you know, it's in, a, it's in like an industrial kind of town and uh, everybody was losing their jobs because it was like, it's all centered around the steelworks in Scunthorpe. Oh, uh, okay. But so then the government sell off the steel industry or everybody loses their jobs. The town center goes in decline. Yep. You've got streaming, you've got the, you know, you've got major labels as well, being greedy, and that was it. It was the perfect yeah. storm, because yeah. at the end of that movie, everybody dies, so. Yeah, but he's kind of like a zombie then, because he came back and he, he's now selling, he's, he managed to save a lot of the shop's stock. Oh, wow. So we're actually sat on here, we're sat on tens of thousands of um new old stock vinyl and secondhand vinyl as well. Oh, wow. And he's grad- gradually selling just, that's his kind of retirement thing. He just sits and lists it on eBay and sells it gradually. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to sort out all the seven inches. We've got tens of thousands of seven inch singles. Wow. Crazy stuff as well. Absolutely crazy stuff. Oh man. So, well, I'm looking for uh, a band I recently got into is Swans. So I'm going to, I'll be keeping an eye oh, on yeah. some Swans. The trouble is, I was, all the Swan stuff I'm keeping. That's. <laughs> I was kind of yeah. afraid you're going to say that. <laughs> that's because that's my bag. That is, I love Swans. Yeah, I kind of I was aware of Swans in the late '80s, and it was all like kind of cop and greed and that kind of stuff, yeah. really industrial. And I I knew them because I was re- I was into industrial music as well, and I really liked things like, um, you know, obviously. The the weirder stuff as well, and Throbbing Gristle, and then like you know bands like. Later on, cop shoot cop and things like that. But I like that really heavy industrial uh, kind of percussion kind of stuff. Yeah, like Neubauten. But then, when, like you say, when White Light and and um, Love of Life, I can remember it like in the shop. There was the double CD box, the black oh. box with the silver thing. Yeah. And it was like I was sorry. I was like, what the hell is that? And I looked. It was like, oh, this is Swans. And I was and I was blown away by the whole box and the covers, the yeah. album covers. I was like, I'm gonna get back into Swans, and uh, and that whole era. So my favorite Swans era is that middle era that includes White Light, Love of Life, um, Children of God, yes. and Burning World. Now the Burning oh. World is that's Jairus. He doesn't like that one. That's right. like so the worst album. That's my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I know it was their the major label thing and all that, but yeah, maybe but... The, I can't comment on that because. Obviously, as an artist, you like and hate albums for different reasons and yeah. everything. I, I'm the same. Most people's favorite CBP album is is probably one that I hate. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so there you go. Yeah. What do we do? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So when did you start forming bands and playing out in public with other people? I mean, I, I've always been just a, 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 a like drummer in a band, really. I mean, I've always written music. I've always written songs for the bands that I've been in, but mm-hmm. they've never been sort of my bands. I mean, the first kind of band that I've left my own little area, the band called LAL, which is like a, I had it from school, you know? Okay. Like a 
hardcore grind band. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're just noisy, you know? Yeah. And uh, one of our first gigs was with uh, Napalm Death. Wow. Uh, at the Kaleidoscope in Birmingham, and that was in 1988. Oh, wow. So that was with the classic lineup. That was Lee Dorian and Bill Steer and Mickey Harris and Shane. Oh, man. Uh, so that was like the the classic scum from obliteration era yeah and uh, i remember because it was just before i learned it's just before i passed my driving test i think i was like <laughs> 17 at the time and uh we had to go on the train to okay. birmingham we played with no bass player because his mum wouldn't let him go <laughs> um yeah and then after the gig, we hung around and we was talking so long, we missed our train home, so we had to sleep in the Birmingham train station in the telephone box. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was an early, early uh, experience. But it's a hell of a way to really break lucky. in. Yeah, I mean, super lucky, though, because that kind of U- UK crusty hardcore scene of the late 80s, you know, the John Peel kind of stuff. And yeah. Like Extreme Noise Terror and Doom and Bolt Thrower and Napalm Death and Electro Hippies and such amazing time amazing bands amazing shows the shows everything you could play like in the local town and there'd be 200 people there and they'd all be going crazy wow different times man yeah Yeah. i've never seen it like that since it came about the mid 90s all that sort of stuff really sort of died out yeah things were just shifting at that point it was just a really weird from that to the early 2000s were just a weird weird time everything started to shift like even yeah we were talking about before with streaming and all it's just i think yeah music the internet, you know yeah the internet really devalued music a lot yeah and it, and it broke it broke up a lot of close contact scenes yeah so like before before all that like i said that that kind of uk underground scene mm-hmm. people were like calling people up on the phone you know you go to your telephone box and put money in and and talk to a, lo- a promoter in Birmingham. Like I, I was literally doing that, you know, and um, Daz Russell, the, the promoter, you know, Simon from Siri Ball Fix put me in touch with this guy, Daz Russell. Okay. And I was in the telephone box put, feeding it 10 peas. Yeah. And, and he was like, yeah, I'll put you on with Napalm Death, you know. Man. And that's how things happen. So you speak to people with your voice, you go and meet them, you go, you travel to places. Yep. You meet other bands, you write to each other on paper, you send each other cassette tapes. Yeah. And all of that, basically, when, when the internet come along, it basically it disbanded that because it gave people access to so much stuff. And all of a sudden, they were like, they would drop their local scene and, yeah. and listen to things from Mexico or something like that. And Yeah. You know, there was... I mean, that's great and everything, but but it, it didn't keep anything together. Yeah, it, it's, it's great to be able to... To, to broaden your horizons like that, but it also, like you're saying, really had a bad effect on local things because you had an investment when you yeah. had to feed the phone or buy cassettes, mail them out, you know, spend the money for the postage yeah. to mail it out. And now yeah. it's just an email, you attach a file, send it away, and it's forgotten about. It's, it's exactly like you said, you, you, you invest, you, you appreciate things more. It's like when you spend your money, on on an actual physical product you just appreciate it more because you've got something to show for your for, for your money you know it's not throw away and thing and i think things should cost money yeah you know i'm no capitalist right i don't make money anymore out of doing music right because of the whole world situation and everything but i still do it you know i don't i, I don't do it for them well i have to pay my bills but i don't it's not the this main is not focus something i do for money yeah you know <laughs> yeah You're i not- need to do this the money side of it's a bonus if I get it. Yeah. But anyway, that side, somebody invests their whole kind of life and passion and everything into making an album. I don't think people should really just get it for free because that person won't be able to do it anymore if if that continues. It's not sustainable. So exactly. I didn't. I never minded paying for albums. No. You know, I'd, I'll, if I download something, I'll pay for it even. But back in, you know, like I said, I sound like an old old fogey but back in the day when you did have cassettes and vinyl and everything because it cost you money you hold that a lot more dear yeah you know and you, you yes. do invest your time you know because you, you could you used to go into a record shop and browse through and you would take a chance on an album you didn't know what it was but you bought it because of the album cover yes and 
And it's that whole gamble. You didn't know whether you're going to like it or not, you know? Exactly. I did that. One of my favorite things to do would be, let's say there's an album that I absolutely loved. I would read the liner notes in depth. I, and I, I would just read over and over again. Even more so than lyrics, I would read the liner notes and I would say, all right, they're thanking this band for touring with them. They're thanking this band and this band. And that's how I found some of my favorite bands. But again, yeah. you're just going off of the association with this band you love. You're taking a gamble on that band. It's like an educated guess, isn't it? Exactly. You, think, you look at the cover and you think, but this looks interesting. And then you, like you say, you start reading, you think, oh, it's on such and such a label or that guy's got um, a siege uh, t-shirt on or a, you know, life sentence t-shirt on or something. And, and yes. you go, okay, well, if these guys are into cryptic slaughter, then I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to take a chance on them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, I can't even tell you how many albums I bought because of cover art. There's, there's some bands that nobody knows about. There's this awesome band from the nineties called collision that I, I love. Oh, yeah. They only put out two albums. They, well, there were two right. collisions. There's one punk band and one more, more of a rock band. And I, I got into more of the rock band and uh, they're out of New York city. And uh, there's another band called the beyond that I really thought their first, not the, not the English beyond. <laughs> I don't remember it. The album was, it was like an underwater picture of a whole school of hammerhead sharks. Yeah, it is. Yeah, they're, they're a British band. The Beyond, I think I saw The Beyond and they were supporting, I think it was like Faith No More, but it that was in the right. late 80s. Faith No More came over and played, played in Scunthorpe, which is like, it's not even a big town, but it was with Chuck Mosley. It was, oh, they, they, just released, they just released the original We Care A Lot. Yeah. Right? The, the only album you could get was the one with the Star David on it and yeah. everything, you know. And of course... I'd already sort of heard it and liked it from it being in the shop, right? Yeah. But they, they were not very well known at all. And and they played at the, the local venue and there must have been about 30, 40 people there. It was the local kind of scene guys, you know what I mean? It was like, oh, well, there's a band and you always see the same 40, 50 people <laughs> at every gig. Yeah, yeah. And that was really good. And that they, they were really, really good that day. And then they actually came back when with Mike Patton about two years later, right? the venue was fucking rammed. Really? There was a hundred people, yeah. And to be honest, and the Beyond played and, and a band called Scat Opera. And, um, <laughs> you know, I think I prefer the Chuck Mosley gig. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not being a snob, but there was a lot more soul then. You know, I don't know why I'm not, I'm, I think I'm not really a big Mike Patton fan, really. But, I'm hit uh, and miss with his stuff. I don't like the, I just don't like the, the, the faith and more like the funky metal stuff. Right. And that's, yeah. And that the beyond is definitely along yeah, those I'm not, lines. I'm not big, I, I like crossover kind of genres. I like, well, I mean, I like what I like, but yeah, a, a lot of that, I mean, I think some like bands like Mordred, it, it was a bit too hit and miss for me. Yeah. And faith, faith and more definitely had the songs. Yeah. You, that's the thing. You, you can't just do a crossover and it just work because you are a funk metal band or you're a, you're a ska punk band or whatever. It doesn't matter what you are. As long as you've got the songs, it's like, I can't stand less than Jake. Oh yeah. I, I, I like the mighty, mighty boss tones. Oh really? Yeah. Because the boss tones have got the songs. I, you know, I've never gotten into ska. I've, I've listened to it. One of my best friends loved it. Mm. And mm. I just, I it's, can... not, it's not my, it's not my bag. Right. <laughs> I can appreciate anything, so. You know, <laughs> that's your record store. That's your record store background right there. You can appreciate it all. It's just uh, I've been able to hear so many things, you know. Yeah, exactly. So I'm just lucky, really. And, you know, I like to keep an open mind. It's, uh, that's all it is, you know. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. What was the first band that actually got you in the studio and, and recording? I had a band called Life Class, which was about 89. That was the first sort of proper demo that we did in a, in a studio in Hull. In fact, Chapel Studio is where I record all the albums now. Okay. The first time I went there was in 92, I think. And that was with a band called Mental Seizure, which was, that was a proper band that by then. Um, okay. We were, we were kind of a local band, but we did UK tours. So we got out of our area and we did like lots of recording and things like that. 
was that before or after uh, Hard to Swallow and Iron Monkey? Uh, Hard to Swallow was basically it was Metal Seizure. And then I moved down to Nottingham in about '93, I think it was. Okay. '93, '94 was a band called Bradworthy, which was a punk band that I did with. Um, can you remember Unseen Terror? The earache band with basically it was um, Mitch Dickinson okay. and Shane Embry from Napalm Death. Oh, okay. They did Unseen Terror. Okay. Anyway, I did a punk band with Mitch Dickinson, and that got me involved with the music scene in Nottingham. Okay. And because of him, he was working at earache, and I got to know all the earache guys very well. Of course, I already knew Napalm from a few years before right. because. <laughs> I was already in touch with like, cause Lee Dorian's a good friend of mine now, you know, oh, awesome. from over the years. So yeah, it all made sense. Everything was, there's a small world, everything coming together. Yeah. Hard to Swallow, I think was the end of 94. definitely 95 it could have been 94 but definitely 95 and that basically i dropped everything else because as soon as i was i kept on doing hard to swallow but i was in about three bands i mean i was in another band called earth tone nine and oh, okay. i basically dropped, i dropped everything carried on with hard to swallow but it, as soon as i monkey came along that that was like oh this is my band my thing you know yeah because it felt like yeah Every band that I was in, I felt it like it was my band as much as everybody else I'm, I'm talking about, you know. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't, I know, I'd not really sort of formed the band since the ones at school and things like that. And Hard to Swallow, I joined Hard to Swallow after their drummer left. Okay. I, but I, Monkey, I knew Jim from the 80s. And then I knew Johnny separately because I met him in Nottingham because he worked in a skate shop. On the, I worked in another <laughs> record shop called Way Ahead. <laughs> So I was working in the record shop in Nottingham and Johnny was working in the skate shop just on the same street. Oh, and we okay. used to, he used to come in and I used to sell him hardcore records. You know, <laughs> we were both into like bands like Integrity and Sam Black Church and all that real hardcore. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So me and him got friends and we ended up going and playing snooker at the snooker place all across the road after work. It turns out that Johnny knew my friend Jim Rushby separately. Oh, Okay. Right, so we both knew the same guy, but from different times. That's funny. <laughs> and we were both we were both played in bands with him and things, right? So we got talking. We're like, oh my god, I can't believe we we both know Jim. Where is he now? Oh, he's in Bradford. Jumped in my car. We we, we drove to Bradford. <laughs> so Johnny knew where he lived, right? I didn't know where he lived, but Johnny did. And we drove up there and we knocked on his door. And he come to the door. Of course, he knows both of us, <laughs> but he doesn't know. We even know each other. <laughs> so he, he honestly thought that we'd somehow just randomly come to see him after years of not seeing him at the same time. <laughs> so it was, it just went, poof, you know, his mind exploded. Oh my um, gosh. So that basically, we just hung out at his house and within like an hour, we, we'd formed a band. And then Jim moved down to Nottingham and then eventually Doug, who, he, who was living with Jim in Bradford, he moved down to Nottingham and that, that was, our, that was I monkey. That's how it came about, you know? So I monkey was like ours, you know, yeah. it really felt like it was kind of meant to be. It was very just fortuitous. It wasn't planned. Yeah. It was friends, you know? And then you, your friend just thought you guys just showed up at the, the, his door at the same time. So it had to be, it was meant to be. 
Yeah, he can, he can, he can work out what's going on, man. He's, <laughs> he, he's, he, we knocked him for a Fruit Loop, I tell you. That's awesome. <laughs> I think that's one of my favorite stories I've heard on this podcast. I love that. Yeah, no, honestly, it's the God's honest truth. No word of a lie. That yeah. is awesome. I mean, we don't we don't see each other anymore now, but I, I heard him uh, an interview with him not so long ago, and he told exactly the same story, and I was just like, <laughs> oh, good man. You know? <laughs> so yeah. I heard you guys had a pretty interesting reputation people thought you guys formed in prison yeah well never let the truth get in the way of a good story huh? <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> how the hell did that get started i have no idea i really don't i think the first i really heard that was a band called germ flux uh, they were like some southern state band they were like kind of in with maybe buzz oven and i ate god and I, those bands so they used to send, they sent, I think it might have been Johnny, actually. I think they sent one of, one of the guys uh, a rehearsal tape. And on the end of the rehearsal tape, they would send us messages, you know, give oh. us a shout out at the end. Okay. And we're like, and at the end of one of them, there was going, oh, any band that can, any guys that can go into jail and come out and be in a band, God damn, that's hell of a man. <laughs> you know, it's going, they've got to come, come down to Guinea and smoke this oyster dope we've got, you know, <laughs> dredged up from the ocean by scallop junkies. <laughs> so anyway, we just thought this was hilarious, you know, and we ended up actually putting a book, like they were talking like this and we've actually stuck it on the end of one of the albums. It's, it's oh, pretty funny. That's awesome. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, there was loads of, there's loads of rumors, you know, I think what it was in all seriousness was, we weren't honestly, genuinely, were not bothered about making friends or being popular or anything. It was one of those bands, and um, when you look back on it, yeah, I mean, very, I'm very fortunate to have been in a very genuine band like that. Yeah. But it was shit at the time, you know. Yeah. It was. We went, we went through absolute hell with that band. Yeah. But we had the best laugh at the same time. It was never, never anything in the middle. It was always extremely good and extremely bad. Oh, wow. Um, so a band like that's never going to last, you know? So we were always destined to, to, to split up at some point. It was just like, I appreciated the time that we did have, you know? But yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think it was because that, say for instance, when we, when we traveled to London for a show, Bands are always getting ripped off, you know? Yeah. And we'd play, I can think of examples, you know, we'd play one show at the, at the Marquee Club and the promoter basically ripped us off 50 pounds, right? Right. And 50 pounds is not much, but that was our petrol home. Yeah. That was like, we couldn't even, we couldn't even buy a fucking pasty from this service station, you know? Man. And it was like, we'd gone all the way down there and people came to the show to see Iron Monkey. And this guy's like, short changing us so we can't even fucking drive home we had no money to put in the petrol tank right uh -huh. so what do we do we start smashing shit up don't we of course you do yeah right because we're, we're we're really pissed off get your money's worth yeah yeah and i think johnny tried to throw a like a breeze block through the marquee window but <laughs> <laughs> um, he did and you know what we, we were over the road in the van watching him and he picks up this heavy thing and he's like <laughs> Right, the marquee that must have seen him on the security camera, and the metal shutters just came down really slowly, like this. And by the time he shuffled across the road with his brick, the thing had shot him. He just sort of dropped him, and went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that brick was going through the window. Oh my god! Yeah, we, we got into fights and stuff. You know, Johnny pulled some lighting rig down at a bikers club, and the bikers were after him for a while. And oh my god! Yeah. He smashed a guy on the head with a monitor, but not accidentally. Okay. <laughs> the guy, the, the, there was this one show in, in Brighton, and uh, the backstage was the kitchen of the pub. Johnny, we've, we found this big catering-sized bag of flour in the kitchen. And oh. Johnny said, for some reason, he said, second riff of the second song, that flower was going in the fan. <laughs> <Right? laughs> and we were just like laughing. Alpha was going, yeah, yeah, good idea, right? Yeah. Anyway, the way we used to go on stage, we used to play like a long intro before Johnny ever, ever came out on stage. Okay. So we were there playing the intro. He just comes straight out, didn't wait for the second song with his bag of flower. <laughs> straight into the fan. <laughs> the whole place turns white with flower. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, good, good start. And anyway, people started throwing beer and water, and and you just turns to dough. Oh, right? good. <laughs> so it's all slippery and everything, you know. And there's glass everywhere. <laughs> anyway, Johnny was um, wrestling about with this guy, and this is, this guy was like the way Johnny was. He was really full on on stage, and I think some people thought they could take him on because it was a bit of a challenge. Oh, okay. So this one, he was a fucking idiot. This one guy thought, oh, I'm going to take him on, you know, and he was wrestling with him and that. But he wrestled him, and Johnny had the monitor in his hand. I don't know why. He just had the monitor in his <laughs> hand. Anyway, oh my slipped, God. monitor came down and basically crushed this guy's head. Oh, my um, God. He's, oh yeah, of course, he survived, but then he started a real fight then. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the show came to a halt because his friends started fighting with Johnny. Drums went to one side, guitars came off, the band started fighting the crowd. Oh, my right. God. The, the, the show ended, and we got banned from Brighton, and Johnny got arrested. The entire town? Uh, the council the... banned us from playing in Brighton. Wow. Um, and, and I had to go and get Johnny from the police station a few days later. Oh, um, my God. The, the, the charges got dropped because the guy basically who got hurt, he said that he was just some random guy on the street and he didn't know the band. And he went to check us out and Johnny singled him out and attacked him. That was his story. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Yeah. So the, 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 the police were like, this guy's a joke. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So we got let off and it was okay. But sorry for the long story, but no, that, no. it's things like that, right? That gave us a reputation, but we didn't do anything for that. Right. You no, know, it, wasn't, it wasn't. It just kind of <laughs> happened. Fine. It's just. Yeah. You know, I mean, we used to play with bands like One Minute Science and they used to go to in Kerrang magazine and say, oh, we, we're going to start a riot, you know, smash the place up, motherfuckers. Right. Like. When, but then when somebody like us came along and shit like that just happened yeah. and we didn't mean it, yeah. right? <laughs> people, but pe people are genuinely frightened of it. So that's why Iron Monkey had a name, but we still never got big or famous or anything like that yeah. because I think promoters wouldn't put us on. Yeah. Magazines used to give me this, oh, the world's toughest band and uh, bullshit. You know, yeah. It's all bullshit. You know, the but fact is that it gave us a reputation that we couldn't fucking get a gig. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Kind of, it backfires, unfortunately. And, and you're not yeah. even promoting that kind of reputation. That it's just stuff no, that's no, happening. No, no, just, yeah. Yeah. Because it, I, I guess that we weren't really that bothered about like how it affects us. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that one, that one time where we, we smashed the place up cause we were short changed. There was a, like a, a, some kind of shitty band called one minute silence from London that were playing. And that, yeah. they were big in Kerrang. They were big for a while. Their singer was calling us up at home afterwards saying, you've got to tell us, tell, tell the guy it wasn't us. It wasn't us. You got like, this is our career, man. That's the difference. You know? Yeah. Then you ended up, you, you played with electric wizard, which is mm -hmm. really cool. Uh, Teeth of lions. That, <laughs> Holy crow. It's not an easy listen, that is it? That was something else. I didn't know about that until a few days ago, and I started listening to it. I, it's I played horrible, the... I thought. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so different. I mean, it, it's... Okay, so you have to answer this question for me. The first song, <laughs> Feel Bad Hint of the Winter. Yeah. Is that are you just intentionally poking Queens of the Stone Age with that or Yes. <laughs> Greg, he's he's friendly with that kind of group of people. Okay. And, um, in fact, it was around that time when we were doing Teeth of Lions, Goat Snake were on tour with Queens of Stone Age. I remember being at one of their shows, obviously because of Greg, and uh, there was a lot of jabbing going on. And of course, 
I kind of knew those the Queens of Stone Age because Iron Monkey played the first ever Queens of Stone Age show in England. Oh, really? Yeah, the little known fact. I didn't know that. That's uh, crazy. Yeah, at the garage when there were three piece with uh, was it Armano playing drums? Uh, I gosh, I don't, rem- I don't anyway, remember. Anyway, it was it was it was Josh and Nick and, Josh and, and, Nick and the and drummer. Him. Anyway, that aside. So yeah, so I think that that feel bad hit of the winter that was a little little jab from probably I can't remember who came up with it, it as either Steve or Greg, but it was on there. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, and, and I'm listening because I'm listening at work with the headphones on, and I'm listening, and the, this song it's really interesting because it takes a while to develop, quite a while. Yeah, we made it up <laughs> as we went along. Really? Yeah, oh, it, wow. was, it was well. We had some ideas for riffs, yeah, um, and they were kind of proto Sun riffs. And in fact, I think a couple of those riffs ended up on a Sun album. I oh, seem to okay. remember because I, I was going to ask. Album, you. Well, they were already doing Sun, but I don't think Sun had done much. I think they'd released their demo, and their first album was almost done or something. I can't okay. remember. It was about that time. It was two thousand anyway. Cause, yeah, because it definitely has a Sun vibe to it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we but we recorded that live in the smallest room. I mean, it was a, no bigger than what I'm saying now. You know? Oh my god! Um, it was like a really small rehearsal room with mic set up, and we had the biggest wall of amps. And <laughs> I kid you not, I was playing the drums at one end of the room, right? Yeah, trying to sort of shield it a little bit. I could feel the air moving when the guitars were playing because it was very oppressively loud. Wow. You don't get that. You don't capture it on the on the album, unfortunately. But you could never do that. Yeah, you, you had to be in the room. So we had some wow. ideas for riffs. Well, Steve had the ideas for riffs, and uh, I wanted to do the Killdozer cover. And we sort of said, okay, let's do these things. And then we we didn't have any kind of arrangements or anything like that. So we basically improvised the rest. That's amazing. Uh, and we didn't go back and redo anything. It was just. However, it came out. The first improvisation is what it is. Wow! So it's, like, it's a little bit, it's a little bit janky in places and everything, but whatever, you know. Yeah, hey, yeah. I mean, that's why we didn't do a second. We've no, never done a second album because it's been discussed in the past. You know, we've, it's been mentioned, but everybody says in the end, in the end, nobody really picks it up because it's like, how do you re, how do you do something else? Yeah, and we and- never because that album is a product of a situation uh, like an actual. Uh, coming together at that time yeah. and it was so spontaneous you can't do it again no it, it wouldn't be as genuine if, if you did it and, no, exactly. even if you did the same thing it just wouldn't everybody's in a different place at this point yeah exactly exactly yeah it was a product of its time uh, but it, I think it was ahead of its time but I, I do appreciate it's not an easy album to listen to so but it you know it's it is an amazing listen though it's really wild stuff yeah, you have to really d- detach from reality for yeah. that album. <laughs> which, which didn't work so well when I was at work. So, <laughs> but, Classic. you know, yeah. it, it was okay. I mean, <laughs> yeah. It was funny, though, because at the same time I, was, I did that album, I was playing in the Verrucas, and I was still doing, I think I had to swallow just finished, but we were doing Armor of God, okay, which yeah. was Jim and Johnny and myself and my monkey, but it was like a hardcore band, fast yeah. stuff. I feel the same on this on the phone You do the turn on the phone and you hold If you didn't take it to do You can't get through the night I'm blinded by my loathing I'm the one you want in a bed You want to see in your face I think you're just a little shit yeah, it was like everything else was going faster and that did the T yeah. Lions thing. Like it's <laughs> like, a very strange time actually. Yeah, yeah, everything's going faster except for this one thing you're doing and it's just yeah. sludge. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's the sludgiest sludge <laughs> I've ever heard. <laughs> sludge disaster, there you yeah. go. That's a whole new genre it, right there. It's a it's a doom disappointment. <laughs> 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 So how did Cripple Black Phoenix get started? Because that's a huge, it's worlds mm-hmm. apart from Iron Monkey and, and even Teeth of Lions. I mean, it's just completely mm. different. I guess it's just because like, yeah, I mean, I love 
the kind of music that I played with those bands, you know, yeah. doom, sludge, hardcore, punk, grind, whatever. Love it. But that's just a small fraction of what I'm into and what I listen to. So, uh, I mean, one of my favorite kinds of music is like that kind of old amphetamine reptile kind of, you know, the noise rock stuff. Yeah. And my favorite, my favorite band, I think in our world is like God bullies, you know, another favorite band is no means no. Yes. You know? So that was weird. My favorite band is no means no. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I'll see what you did there. <laughs> So I think what it was, when when I got to a point, I think it was probably Electric Wizard disillusioned me quite a bit about the whole scene. Oh, really? Yeah, that wasn't, I mean, yeah, great band. I was into Electric Wizard before, and we played some shows together Yeah, with Iron Monkey and that, but that whole experience just put me off playing in a band. Wow. Because of the, the, the utter shitty behavior that went on really you know? but, yeah i mean i'm not one to go into details i'm not going to talk about yeah. i'm not going to talk shit about people when they've got a cat they're not here to reply you know exactly um, exactly that put me off playing like doing stuff that other people want to do okay. i think i'd always had my kind of i'd like to do more but i can't within the, the confines of this certain band or whatever like i'm never going to be able to do a no means no cover version with electric wizard or iron, or monkey, iron monkey yeah <laughs> so i just decided i'm just going to do my own thing but i had a big i had a bit, a bit of a break i did some cripple like phoenix demos while i was still in electric wizard and then just forgot about it <laughs> and then i had a bit of a rough time personally for a couple of years and then picked up a friend's acoustic guitar and just started writing my own things wow and then i knew jeff barrow from portishead that i'd met uh, Electric Wizard show one time, and I kept in touch with him. And he, I'd also known Dominic. You know, you know the band Mogwai. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I love so Mogwai. One of my best friends in the music, my whole music career was was Dominic. Oh wow. And I'd, I'd met him years before when I was still doing Iron Monkey, and um, it was I was actually on a job. I was crewing for Manic Street Preachers. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And Mogwai was supporting them. It was what their first big tour. Oh, cool. Um, and I didn't know Mogwai at that point, but me and the bass player from my monkey, Doug, we were packing the, the gig afterwards and I got a tap on my shoulder and it was Dominic and John from Mogwai. And they were like, are you using I a monkey? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I was just like, who wants to know? Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. he said, we love your band. We do, we, we do a DJ slot at this club and we play I monkey all the time. So... We got friends with with Mogwai, you know, wow. and that was 90, 97, maybe nine, nine, around that time. So when it comes to Cripple of Phoenix, Dominic used to come down and visit, you know, I used to go up and visit him, you know, so he was just randomly staying at my house and we were sat there and was watching the, the Eurovision Song Contest and we were just jamming, you know, and I was playing him some demos that I did previously and we were jamming onto them and then got talking to Jeff one day and I was like, oh yeah, I've been jamming with Dominic. And he was like, oh, you got to come down to Bristol and, and do some recording. I was like, yeah, I don't know. You know. Yeah. Anyway, one thing led to another and I went down there and they said, okay, um, no money. You can come and use the studio, but we'll put your album out on wow. Invader. Wow. So we didn't have to pay for the recording because it was on Jeff's label. It was Jeff's studio. That's awesome. So the first group of Black Phoenix album, there was no band. <laughs> So the band wow. was the band basically on, on the first album it was friends of jeff who came to help me make an album and that's how i met the guys in the band at that point oh Apart wow from dominic, obviously. dominic and costas i knew separately but so that was yeah uh, and, I love and, and, and then, yeah Fat Paul, he he said, "Well, we should play some gigs." And again, he was one of those. Nah, I don't know. Oh no, play some gigs. Oh, okay then. <laughs> and then that's when, that's when the, it became more of a band. But it was 
Wow. It was never a band, really. It was like people coming to help out when they can, you know, and things like that. It was. It's, it's been a weird beast for many years, until I think until like Ellen Geist, like literally the last couple of years, and it has become a band now. There's five of us. Wow, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, I've noticed there's been a lot of turnaround in the band, and actually one of the the band members I thought was really interesting was Chris Heilman. Oh yeah, from Shark Island. <laughs> yeah, I love Shark Island. Bill and Ted. Right? Yes, I've. <laughs> so I bet you're thinking, Chris Hellman, Shark Island, CBP. How the fuck does that work? <laughs> exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> how did you end up meeting? Yeah. I mean, it's just it was just weird. No, I mean, I I knew him as a friend before he was in in the band and. Uh, he, I knew him through Carl DeMarta, who was also a friend of mine that I used to work with at Plastic Head Records. Okay. Uh, at some point, you know, because I used I used to jam with with Chris and uh, Carl in Carl's kind of blues country cover versions band. Oh. And we used to we used to do gigs locally for money, you know. Okay. It was like a few piece kind of rock and blues country thing. So I was playing with those guys, and then it came around where, for whatever reason. CBP, we got um, some shows booked, like a European tour and, and a couple of other bits. Uh, I think we actually went to Canada as well. We didn't have the guitarist or bass player at that point. <laughs> so it was like, oh, well, I'm playing with Chris and Carl in Carl's band. I'll ask those guys because I'm already playing with them, you know? So right. I, know them, I know them as musicians. So that's how they, they came to play in CBP, but then... We did one show and Chris couldn't go out of the country because of his visa or something. Okay. So it was a little bit later when Chris actually did more with CBP. But they they weren't songwriting, you know. It's like I say, it's, it's, it's a weird beast, basically. Yeah. Everybody is is like, they came and they played kind of thing. They played their parts, you know, not taking anything away right, from, right. from what people did. But um, no, I mean, Chris, he was a funny guy. You know? he's, he's, he's a cool guy. It was a shame that he kind of, he went off and because Carl tried to steal the band name and things like that. It was I pretty, heard that, yeah. It was pretty bad for a while. I don't want to go into it, but no. I mean, the guy, the guy registered the trademark behind my back and was still played it within the band for two years without telling me. And oh my god! And, and tried tried to try to sabotage the whole band. And <laughs> for, for whatever reason, Chris decided to to go with Carl and do do oh, that. Oh man! So it was a real shame because you know. I, Right up until then, I had no problem with the guy. Yeah, uh, I hate you know, hearing stories like that. I've not, I've not spoken to him since or anything. I mean, Carl, on the other hand, you know, I'll knock the fucker out if I see him. But yeah. Chris, I've got no problem with. You know, well, the first time I actually heard Cripple Black Phoenix was the song you did with David Eugene Edwards on the Jeffrey mm -hmm. Lee Pierce. Mm. I love David Eugene Edwards. I am obsessed by his work. And so any anything that he's involved in, I I have to get. So, yeah, right. So I found that We Are Only Riders album. And like David Eugene Edwards, I don't care what he's doing or who he's playing with. I, I've got to get it and I've got to hear it. And so I heard uh, Like a Mexican Love and I'm like, who is Cripple Black Phoenix? This is awesome. And you do another song on that. And those two. Yeah, but it's not like that one. No, no, it's not. Watching from the cement grass, scared to walk straight. She evades you straight through town. And she beats upon your paper face This must be some kind of Mexican love And I'm glued it's, to you It's just... Well, just like, like we were like saying earlier, the association with an artist that I loved got me to you guys. And so right, I, yeah. I listened and I'm like, all right, I gotta check this out. And I Vigilante was the latest release at that point. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so I picked that up, and that album just blew me away. It was wow. so amazing. And to hear, to find out, you know, that you're in Iron Monkey and, and some other really hardcore bands, to go from that to a more Pink Floyd-sounding band, is, it just kind of blew my mind. 
<laughs> I don't know why I, it, I had a hard time reconciling the fact that you can do those kind of, you can make those kind of switches, I, but I just, I just, I just, I just thought that, um, it just with Cripple Bob Phoenix was always a disappointment for people who listened to it because they were expecting another Iron Monkey or Electric Wizard or whatever. Wow. That's, that's the kind of the feeling that I always had with, with Cripple Bob Phoenix. That's I always amazing. thought, and the, and the thing is that the press picked up on, like in the early days of CBP, they picked up on the fact that Jeff Barrow, it was his label. He also played drums with us for a couple of gigs. Yeah. Um, so he'd been on stage with us and Dominic from Mogwai was in the band. And it was this Mogwai, Portishead, Electric Wizard, super, super group. Uh, and it, it, it was never, ever that at right. all. It was never that. And the music, musically, it's nothing like any of those bands, really. That's you know? for sure. So I, I always thought that uh, it was a disappointment for everyone, and that's that's why we didn't get that much attention and stuff. Wow. I think people came and sniffed around us, and then went, "Oh, this is what I thought it was going to be," and then moved on. Oh, see that that's interesting because for me, I, I wasn't aware of the other bands really. I mean, I was aware of Mogwai, I you know I knew Mogwai, but and I knew who Electric Wizard was, but I wasn't really into them yeah. at that point. And so for yeah. me, it was just I was just hearing this amazingly awesome psychedelic type of rock band that oh, was uh, that's nice it's nice that you say psychedelic it's what one thing that people n never really mentioned but I, I i truly believe that it's like in, in in a lot of respects it's psychedelic it's just not the cliche exactly psychedelic. yeah it's not this big space jam aim that's aimless and pointless and i mean every it sounds to me like everything that cripple black phoenix does has a purpose yeah, it's the same way that if people call us a, pro a prog band, we're not a prog band, right? but we're in the spirit of progressive rock. If you think about like between 969 and 74, the progressive rock bands, they didn't fit into a box and sound all the same. They were just experimenting, doing whatever they wanted. For me, that's progressive rock. Right. It's become the label prog rock. And people are la make the lazy kind of connection and the assumption prog rock band or do you sound like Marillion or something you yeah. know it's like we're we just not we're not a prog rock band but we are progressive rock but we're also a punk band you're, you know there's so many different things going on in it so because it, because it's all in the spirit it's all in the spirit and it's all out of respect you yeah. know because my connection with progressive bands is the same connection I have with punk bands to me they're like the same because they do what they like. Yes. They have no limitations in the same way. You know, so people like, oh, punk and progressive, it's like the opposite. It's like, no, man, it's like the same fucking thing. They're There's not... people that, like, they're not afraid to experiment. They're not afraid to stick the neck out and do something different. Yes. They're not confined by whatever genre people give them. No. So we're not Pink Floyd, we're Punk Floyd. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, you don't you don't really hear musically the influence. I mean, obviously you hear some influences, but you wouldn't hear a lot of punk sounds. But if you if you know the history, you will you will hear it. You, you will hear the punk, the punk in there. Yeah, you know? especially on the new. We've just recorded a new album. It's oh. mastered and ready to go. So that's oh, wow. that is gonna is uh, production wise is punk as fuck. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Yeah, it's not it's not the nice chocolatey chocolatey warm cozy <laughs> nice sounding album you know it's the same cbp right right so you've, you've got the rock you've got the light and dark and the quiet bits and the psychedelic you've got all that but the, the way that it's presented is like yeah it's just it's raw it's like a live it's like a live recording oh wow it's not overproduced or anything like oh, that. It's just awesome. super, super, super honest. Awesome. You know? How does the songwriting work within Cripple Black Phoenix? Are you doing music? Are you doing lyrics? Or is everybody bringing in bits and pieces and you're piecing it together? Well, Belinda and Joel write the, the lyrics. Okay. I, I've, I've, I've never, I mean, I have written lyrics for Cripple Black Phoenix before, but nowadays I, I, I don't do that because I, I believe that whoever's singing it has to write it because it's got to come from there their soul makes sense but what i will do is give them the song title oh, okay i will tell them what i'm thinking or what i'm feeling about a certain song that's the only involvement i have with the lyrics 
apart from there's a few song titles now that Belinda has, has named, but because I think because obviously we have a more of a connection when she when she comes up with a song title, it makes sense to me. So because it's not a, you, you understand it's not an ego thing that I want to give all the songs their titles. Okay, it's just. I have the idea and the theme and everything else, you know, so. Okay, so um, that, that makes a lot more sense to me. As, since if you're not writing lyrics, how there are certain themes that keep coming back, specifically World War II. Yeah. I mean, you've got, yeah. you know, Bastogne Blues, Operation Mincemeat, and you do a cover of uh, Burning Bridges. Was a Lilo Sifri. Lilo Sifri wrote the song, but Mike Kerb recorded it for yeah. the Kelly's Hero song. Yeah. Exactly, and that's that's what where the, the for me the, 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 I realized the connection was at the end of, the, of Kelly's Heroes. Yeah, it's the Kelly's Heroes, the seventies heist film, but yes. in World War Two. <laughs> yes, I haven't seen that movie in ages, but oh, it's a it's a great yeah, movie. You've got to go back and revisit it. It's a classic. It is. Um, I, what's your, what's your yeah, connection the, with World War Two? I mean, I just found it fascinating, of, of course. You know, I think it comes from my childhood and my, my granddad. You know, he told me a lot of some stories that he didn't tell anybody else when uh, he was serving, and things like that. Yeah. Um, I, I find that there's very interesting stories to be had in, in time of conflict. You know, um, there's some very, very interesting characters and things that happen that people don't know about uh, yeah. that really deserve to have a light shone, shone on it, you know. Uh, so yeah, I mean it is. It's it's a reoccurring topic, but it appeals to the kind of CBP thing, you know. The like you said, the guys write the lyrics, but it, we all have to be on the same page. And this is one of the things that I think the the original singer Joe, I understand why he left because he didn't want to be told what to sing about. Uh, you okay. know, yeah. but I was contro I was controlling him too much for his liking, which I understand. Okay. I hundred percent understand. I have no problem with that. It's just that. This CBP became just my thing that I wanted to do, you know, and it's great if people come along for the ride, but nothing happens in this band for the sake of it. So just a little tiny example is like, okay, the problems I had with Carl, he believed that he should have his songs that he wrote on an album just because he's the guitarist in the band. So I listened to his songs and I hated every one of them. <laughs> Truly and honestly, I'm not saying they were, they were bad. I'm saying I hated them. Right. <laughs> not my style. Yeah. Not a, and they weren't CBP style. So they didn't go on the album. Yeah. And then he goes, oh, fuck you, Greaves, you know. Yeah. And all this. Because I'm the bad guy, obviously. Of so course. anyway. So I understand that. So I think now, genuinely, with, with Joel and Belinda, we do have the connection. So I don't have to dictate so much but you were asking about the songwriting and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think it's it's got to the point now because basically I've written the music to every single CBP song. Right. Um, and I make the demos and I'm quite involved with the demos. I'll, I'll play parts that become piano parts or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody who plays on the albums or plays in CBP, they do it their way and they bring the, uh, they sprinkle the magic dust and make it what it is. It's right. amazing. I, I'm very lucky to have some very talented friends, you know, oh, um, yeah. and I wouldn't wouldn't be able to do this without any of them, you know. But I think people have left the songwriting alone be, just because over time, it's just that's what I do. Okay. okay. And that's it. And it's as simple as that. It's not the Justin Greaves band, you know. Right. I, never wanted to be, I never wanted to be a solo artist. I was always the drummer in the band. But... I keep writing songs and writing songs and writing songs and no one else gets a sniff in. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you play drums with Cripple Black Phoenix? Why? If, I, I, I record the drums. Okay. But you, on tour, I mean, you, you're playing the guitar. I'm a pretty shit drummer these days. Oh. I'm, not like a, well, I'm not like I used to be. Well, I I'm appreciate a shit the honesty. Well, to be fair, but <laughs> <laughs> 
you, you can get away with a lot more on guitar than you do drums. <laughs> That's a good point. I think, well, truth of it is that I haven't played drums since uh, Electric Wizard live. Oh, wow. And the longer I leave it, the more kind of out of practice I am. I mean, I know I'd get back into it, but I also had like a, a TIA, which is like a mini stroke. Yeah. I So I can feel the difference now, you know, and... I mean, I, I re, like I say, I record the drums, yeah. all, all the CDP albums. I'm happy having my, my drumming on the albums, you know? Okay. And I think in some way, because, because I'm quite precious over my music, mm -hmm. when I play guitar, it feels like, okay, I'm taking care of it more. Okay. It would feel weird. It would feel weird if I've written a song, either on the guitar or on the piano or, or whatever, and then when we go out and play it, I'm, I'm playing the drums for it. Of course, I'd enjoy playing the drums, but it, it would feel a bit weird. It'd just feel that, weird. I that don't makes sense. That makes sense, though. I think if, like, if somebody invited me to play drums in their band just for a, for a giggle and we went on tour, I'd love playing drums on tour again. You yeah. Know? Um, <laughs> but it would it'd have to be someone else's band, I think. Okay. Okay. But you do yeah. play a, a, an interesting amount of instruments i mean there's, there's electric and acoustic guitars bass drums keyboards banjo the saw the saw i love At, playing the saw yeah. and i've seen so i've seen two instances of that once one with nick cave and debbie harry oh yeah i'm i forgot about that <laughs> and then i saw you and some other dude in the woods playing banjo oh, yeah. and saw yeah that was um that's David. He does this. Uh, his solo band thing is called The Devil's Trade. David is uh, he's a really cool guy. We know him from Budapest. Okay. And uh, he he came on tour with us. You know, he was uh, which what tour was that? I think that was when we played a uh, publicist UK toured with us. Oh. Wow. Um, and he was on that tour. And yeah, I mean, of course, you know, that any chance. But any chance we got, we'd sit down and he'd play the banjo and I'd play the saw. And yeah. That video is we, um, awesome. But that was just like, we, we was at playing a, a venue, um, something like Würzburg or something in Germany, but it was in the kind of the, the Black Forest yeah. area. Anyway, there was lots of woods. And <laughs> we, just, we went for a walk and uh, yeah, just found a good spot. So we just grabbed, grabbed the banjo and the saw and just like oh let's just do this little thing you know is that the only thing you guys have recorded together that that little video yeah oh uh, well uh yeah yeah he actually he joined us on stage to sing a cover version of joe walsh's uh turn to stone oh wow <laughs> uh, we did that together. and he also sang on there we did uh we did a tribute to um that band vhk the hungarian kind of tribal punk band oh wow and um, we did Honok Shitaya, which is like Battle of the Huns. Um, oh, and man. him and another guy, they came, they did the recording with us and they sung the, the, the song as it should be in Hungarian. Wow. Some amazing covers. You, you get the stuff like that and burning bridges. I've done a lot of covers, actually. Sometimes I'm a little confused as to which one's considered an album and which one's an EP because they're all long. It makes no difference to me. <laughs> Everyone says, oh, it's, it's a bit long for an EP. You know? I was a bit like, and it's like, yeah, but come on. It's just what it is. It's a fucking record. You yeah. Know? <laughs> it's an album of whatever. But it's you, whatever. Whatever. So you've done 
the Hungarian stuff you, you've done. We've made Burning Bridges. Everything I Say by Vic Chestnut. Uh, she's in uh, parties. Bauhaus. Physical uh, by Adam Ant. And then. Yeah, oh, yeah. Of course, no, no, yeah. My favorite is uh, The Golden Boy That Was Swallowed by the Sea oh. by Swans. In fact, I'm working. I'm working on. Um, I got hold of the the live recording from the two Roadburn uh, gigs that we played. Oh, cool! Uh, and the last one is when we played. Not only did we play Golden Boy, we also played the entire 40 minute version of Echoes. Oh man! Okay, so I did see the uh, one. Yeah. political band you know i'd say we're socially aware yeah um we, we talk about things that people don't like to talk about we talk about more than just music oh yeah like um, the song lost yeah lost and, and nebulas and you know the we we i mean obviously we're animal rights uh, sort of you know i'm quite yeah. an activist in that and it's we just speak for the voiceless you yeah. know just raise awareness it's not political or anything it's like you can choose what you're like we're not telling people what to eat or how to live their lives yeah but that, people don't like it, you know, but whatever. I, I love hearing everybody's opinions who comes on the show. I, if, whether I agree with it, disagree with it, I don't, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I, you don't have to, but I, you do I not have to it. agree with it at all. Nope. Yeah, you don't have to agree with it at all. In fact, some of the best conversations I've, I've had with fans are with people who don't agree with us. Yeah. And, but, and, be, and we become quite close as a result, you know. You, as long as you're not like hurting anyone or hurting you know other people or the things or you're not oppressive or anything like that then i've always got time for people i respect people's way of life you know as long as you're willing to hear my side and i'm willing to hear your side we don't have to agree and still we yeah. can still be friends yeah well i mean you, you that's the only way you're going to learn anything exactly that's fortunately that's one good thing about getting older is that i've i've learned i don't know anything so i'm willing to listen to everybody at this point yeah, you, honestly, I mean, you, they say that you you know older and wiser, but no, you you're older, and the only th only thing you get wiser about is that you know that you don't know stuff. Yep. You accept the fact that you don't know what you think you did. Exactly. You know? And like I say, you become old and you become lazy and you <laughs> stop giving a shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> In fact, the only thing I am sure about is that I think even the stuff I knew, I don't know anymore. Yeah, but I mean, th obviously, you know, things change and everything. And I mean, I'm kind of like half jesting. Of course, we care about things, right. you know. But I think you care less about the trivial things, you know. Yeah. Uh, you sure. care less about what people think about you, or you care less about like impressing people or making so many friends and everything like that, you know. Yeah. Those kind of very kind of shallow things. You you stop caring about those and your life becomes more meaningful, I guess. It becomes more focused on the things that you do enjoy or the things that you do. Uh, I don't, I make no secret of like, I ride bikes and I build bikes and I race as well. Yeah. It's a big part of my life now, you know, and you know, basically 50 year old man that's I'm throwing myself down mountains and hills on bikes <laughs> and breaking my leg and things like that. And, but you used to do that when you were a kid. You used, you raced BMXs as a kid, right? Yeah, OG BMX. I was, yeah. yeah, started started racing in nineteen eighty one. Wow. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. 
Oh, gee. What were, so what were you riding back then? Um, well, I started on a rally burner, but um, I did most of my racing on Skyway TA frame. Oh, cool. Uh, I raced, uh, I had a Diamondback for a short while, and I raced with a team called Mark White, who was the local guy. Won a couple of trophies, you know, just nationals and regionals. Um, nothing international, though. And I've raced until the 90s, and then I got myself a, a, a GT performer which was kind of like the original kind of street freestyle bike. Yeah, I remember those. Um, yeah, I wish I still had it. It was great. <laughs> and then I did a few freestyle competitions, like mini ramp and things. Nice. Then I just ended up riding street with my friends for a while, and then I ended up actually selling that bike to Johnny, the singer in I Monkey. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, because you know, you know Johnny died, so yeah. I don't know what happened to all that stuff. Um, um, but uh, yeah, bikes have always been a massive part. But the music took me down a path in my life uh, and took over. And I neglected bikes for too long. And I think about 10 years ago, I got really heavily back into it. And now I, ra I race gravity bikes, which is that? super sketchy stuff. So gravity bikes is like, it's on tarmac. It's down very steep hills, <laughs> twisty hills. There is like on 20 inch rims and everything, modified kind of frames. Oh, wow. Um, there's no drive chain, no crank or anything. It's all gravity powered. But we get 50, 60 miles an hour out of them. That's yeah. amazing. That's like the top speed you can get on a small road. The world record is like, I don't know, top, high 80s, I think it is. Wow. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's full race leathers, you know? It's oh. like you don't want to. The, the thing with it is that it's because um, it's so fast when you crash you don't stop crashing and, and because of the furniture, because it's on like open roads well we close the roads but they're highways you know? yeah yeah uh, the, there's a lot of furniture like trees and gates and but you know things like that so oh my god um, so it's quite high consequence you know yeah um, god jeez yeah. I think, all right, I'm going to check that out I'm going to see this. Um, actually my my own Instagram thing it's got a lot of my gravity bike stuff on it oh i'll have to check that out i'm not sure if i'm uh, followed your instagram yeah. or not i have to check that out yeah I don't, I don't make like i don't publicize or anything it's just got it's got everything on there you know because i'm like it's like music and but it's bikes but it's art oh as well cool. it's everything that i do so it's a bit i don't draw too much attention to it or anything i don't tag myself in because people are into my music might not be into bikes yeah. and people are into the bikes might, might not like the art well, so after this podcast, it's just there, you know, it's just there to share with my friends, really, you know. After this podcast, you might get up towards of like three more followers. Oh, nice. So, nice. <laughs> well, <laughs> me being one of them. Smart. <laughs> but we can, you know, you can keep up with stuff. It's quite cool, actually, because I am quite proud of the, the gravity. I mean, I, I'm like twice uh, national champion. Oh, wow. One of the years it was just, I just, I was ahead in points. We didn't run the championship one year when the championship was running, I, I won the championship, uh, and, you know, a lot of races, trophies and so on. So oh, that's, that's I'm quite proud of that because I, I'm one of the oldest, you know, so that's I'm not afraid to say that I am quite proud of that. That's great. Yeah. I'll, you've just really intrigued me. I got to check this out. Cause that sounds like it's a <laughs> lot of fun. There's one good video on there where it's like, I got like a, uh, like a selfie stick and put the GoPro up, uh, oh. in front of me on the bike. So yeah. it's quite a cool, cool oh, angle. That, you can... that is awesome. I got to check that out. Yeah, you'll, see, you'll see like cats and no, I, I do mountain biking as well. So there's a bit of mountain biking on there. Oh, I used to, and then I used there's, to there's the music and things as well, of course. So you, uh, you mentioned art and uh, you, yeah. you have some amazing art on your albums. I uh, absolutely, I visual guy myself. That's one of the things I've always enjoyed about the albums is the artwork. It's not always the same. It's not. It doesn't always look like it's by the same person, or there's necessarily a. Uh, everyone, everyone is is extremely different. Like uh, I Vigilante is uh, a lot different from, say, A Love of Sheer Disasters or um, mm -hmm. Night Raider, Mankind, The Crafty Ape. You know, they're all very different. It's but that is, but that's the beauty of art, right? Oh, for sure. You know, it can be you can be whatever you want it to be. I, I love it, but it's all really awesome art. Like Vigilante is the only one that I did. Oh, really? Uh, uh, all the others done by other people. Yeah, that's very striking. That and um, bronze. I really yeah like the. No, uh, I like bronze. In fact, actually, 
Bronze was done by Matthew Dunn, and Matthew Dunn is the, the one guy that we've spent the most time working together. So Matthew Dunn came along and did from Crafty Ape until Bronze. Oh, cool. Basically everything we did in that era was Matthew Dunn. Oh, that, see, and that's awesome because there's some of them, it, it looks like it may be done by the same person, like, like Crafty Ape and the uh, Poznan album but yeah, and no sadness white light right uh, but, they, but they don't necessarily look like they're done by the same artist which is what i really uh, like uh, about that they've all got that kind of graphic novel quality to them but the, yeah sure. but that's just you know i mean that's how talented the guy is you know yeah. he can do some amazing things and it wasn't because um falling out of love with his art i love his art you know and everything he does now he's a great guy great artist yeah i think Maybe we just got to the point where, like, there was a change, you know, just a change overall, you know what I mean? You know, the production's slightly different, you know, yeah. and at some point you you have to, I mean, I'm one for moving on. I always like to move on. And it's not, you know, I'd like to be loyal as well. So it's always quite kind of hard, especially with someone like Matthew, where it's like, I would love to stay loyal to the guy and, and use his artwork forever, like I made him do with, with Derek oh, Riggs. Derek you know? Riggs, yeah. But I don't want that for the band, you know. Well, at, as at, much as I love it, I want, I want, I want to do different things. Yeah. <laughs> at some point, you, it's kind of weird because with Derek Riggs and let's let's say Roger Dean with Yes, you know, yeah, yeah. you just start to kind of not not even really pay attention to the art because you know what style it's going to be. Yeah. And yeah. so it. it I don't like, one thing I don't like is being predictable. Exactly, and that was where I was going to. What I was going to say, it almost becomes predictable. So you're not, you know, Iron Maiden is going to be some version of Eddie doing something weird, and then with Yes, you know, it's going to be this. But that still, that still plays a role. You know, it's like musically as well. You know, when you listen to the Ramones, that's what you're going to get. Yeah. The Ramones were still going. Oh, oh, Motorhead. Oh, those great bands. Oh, the Dwarves. <laughs> oh, God. <yeah. laughs> you know what you're going to get, and it serves that purpose, and it's great. Yeah. That's, okay, yeah. that's, a, that's a fair point, yeah. So that is all valid. That, that kind of consistency, the Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden album, you know what you're going to get. Yeah. You know pretty much what it's going to sound like. You know what the hour's going to be. But that's what you want. That's what their fans want. True. Right? which is great, which is fine. It's just not what I do. It's not what CBP does, you know, and nobody's right and nobody's wrong. It's just, I'm into, I'm into that kind of consistency as well. I like to, if I listen to a crusty punk band like Tragedy, that's what I want to hear. I want the next, yeah. you know, in a way, I mean, there's, there's, there are the bands that like, you never know what you're going to get. And that's kind of the appeal. Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a different thing, you know? And I think uh, CBP kind of falls somewhere in the middle of that because yeah, you don't I mean, always know. What... Different. Yeah. <laughs> there's a sound for, for Cripple Black Phoenix, but you can't always say, all right, well, this, there's, there's going to be one short song. There's gonna, and then it's, the album's going to end with one long epic, like an Iron Maiden album the thing you can count on with cbp is the songs are gonna be epic each every song is going to develop and that's one of the things i love about it is you give the music the room to just develop on its own i suppose because I, I don't like to stick to any rules but if i if i set myself any kind of limitations or rules in cbp is that the music is in charge the songs have to do their own thing it's like I'm only just trying to control it. I'm not really without being in charge, you know, <laughs> of course it, it's, it's difficult, but I try not to dictate the way it goes. So, so the way it comes, the way it sounds is just how it comes out. And if there's one thing that I just, what I'd like to achieve at the end of all of this is a catalog of music. That's at least it's honest. I know? And that's all, that's all really is just, and that's what I think with the, with the new album that we just recorded, I think that's, um, I mean, who knows what the next album will be. It'll, the next album might be super overproduced, 80s synthesized, you know. <laughs> but this, this album is what I'd like to be at the moment, which right. is like, I don't want any trickery. I don't want any easy way is out, you know, because, like, again, I'm not saying there's any rights and wrongs, but I'm not a fan of music that's sort of contrived so it's like a you know what i mean when i say 
a band tunes a certain way and has a certain kind of production value, which basically it will blow you away. It will sound amazing on first listen, but then the, the effect is gone. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. Like a, like a movie with a twist. Yeah. Once you've seen it and that's it, the, 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 the trick's gone. Yeah, you can only watch Sixth Sense once. Yeah. So there's a lot of music like that, which it will sonically, it will be very impressive when you hear it because it'll be different or it'll be super heavy or it'll be weird tuning or something yeah. like that. But it's a sonic trick. But I like to, I like to listen to bands that have got the songs. So as long as you've got the songs, it's great. You can do what you like. But there's a lot of music at the minute, which is like a, a kind of struggle listening to where you think, oh, that sounds amazing. But, you, but it doesn't end up in your favorite albums because you, it only works once or twice and then you're kind of over it, you know? Yeah. And I think I'm probably kind of rebelling against that a little bit. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? I try not to be trying to do anything, but if I'm doing anything, I think I'm re just rebelling against the, the modern trend of, oh, let's make something that will blow people away as soon as they hear it. Yeah. And I kind of don't want, I don't want to, I'm not interested in blowing people away. I just... I just think that it's just a it's just a quick it's a quick fix. Yeah, know? I know what you're saying. I don't, yeah. I don't mind. I don't mind if people don't get it at first because I'd I'd rather have the longevity. I'd rather just we're swimming along under the surface all this time. You know. Yeah, it's it's like both of us with swans. You know, we didn't get it at first, yeah. and then yeah, then when it hit, it grabbed it and held on and doesn't let go. Yeah, it's like no means no. You yeah. know, it's like. They're not the easiest band to get into, but you know, if you if you get into it and you like it, you love it and yeah. you treasure it. You know, <laughs> One I of the... guess if I want to be anything, it's going to be like that. You know, I suppose. But that it's just a dream. You know, it's I can't dictate what people feel about what I do. You know, no, so, exactly. So just do what you want to do. Make make eh, the music the way you want to make it. You know, it's no big fucking secret. Yeah. <laughs> One of the interesting things that I've noticed well i noticed this um, that's a terrible way to say it one of the interesting things that that reoccurs on some cbp albums is the use of audio clips like bastone mm -hmm. yeah, blues yeah. i was hid behind a big tree that was knocked down or fallen and i could see these germans in the woods across this big field and I saw this young kid crawling up a ditch straight towards my tree. So I let him crawl. I didn't fire at him. But when he got up within three or four foot of me, I screamed at him to surrender. And instead of Are these clips that you have found decided, that are influencing the song, or are you writing the song and then looking for a clip that fits with it, or is there any process to it, or is it just happenstance? All the samples come after the fact. Okay. Wow. And that is like part of the process. So you know, we're in the we're in the studio, and it's only in, when we're in the studio where the album starts to make sense to me. So it goes from a bunch of demos that sonically and thematically they kind of belong on the same album but i don't know how it all works yet okay then when we're recording usually the starting and ending of songs the dynamics of the album because i believe in albums need dynamics as well as the songs need dynamics yes the whole sure. album is dynamic um so i compose it more like a film i guess okay. so you have you just have the different scenes and the different moods and everything else, and you have the, the you have the dark and you have the comedy and you have the horror and you have the farce, you know. Right. So it's doing that. So I guess the samples are all part of that, you know. Okay. And they usually come along, you know. I'll hear a part where I'll think, oh, that's a sample bit. That is. Okay. And then I will kind of I will I will fire off what the song's doing or what the song's about, and then I'll get into. I'll either have an idea, like um, it will be from a film that I love or something, like, you know, obviously a classic from Rollerball or Mad Max yeah, or, or whatever it is, you know, Silent Runnings. I've, you know, I've used all these things. They're the sort of things that I go, you know what? I can, I'm thinking of this great quote from this movie that will sound amazing in this little bit. Oh, cool. Those, those ones are really easy to do. Yeah. Sometimes I come across something where like I have a specific idea of what the sample wants. Oh, I need a voice. 
of a certain kind of voice, a male, female, adult, child, whatever, and he needs to be saying something about this topic, and then I have to find it, oh. and that's and then that gets difficult. You yeah, know? it's like the uh, the Alan Watts sample at the start of Great Escape. Every sane society allows a certain number of people to deviate. You don't have to join. You don't have to play the game. A society which is insane and unsure of itself. Long monologue that Alan Watts does. For the longest time, I couldn't find anything for the start of that album. I knew exactly what I wanted to say. And I was almost on the verge of trying to get somebody to do it for me. Oh, wow. Write some work, you know? Yeah. And then I just I happened to find a lecture by Alan Watts. And then all of a sudden, I was like, oh, Bruce Derning in, in Silent Running. <laughs> He's, uh, he does something really cool that would really fit with this. And then the whole thing snowballs and it became what it is, you know. Oh, that is awesome. But the, on the new album, we do have a friend who has done us a spoken word and it's incredible. Oh man. I can't give too much away. Okay. But it's, uh, it's very, very subversive. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it might be a little bit shocking for some people. But really? There you go. Oh, and wow. he's a very, he's a very fucking cool guy and he's such a talent. And, I mean, I love him a bit. He's a freak, but the best way, in the best way. Oh, man. He's, he's a very, very interesting guy. Oh, and man. he's an artist as well. He's an artist. He does loads of different things. Oh, yeah. all right. It's me. <laughs> it's definitely me. I didn't realize I was doing it, but it, secret's out. <laughs> yeah, you also, you yeah. also do a couple other projects. We'd, we'd mentioned them at the beginning, you know, Say Delon and World War. Mm -hmm. Are yeah. those projects that you're continuing to do more with, or are they kind of set aside while the new CBP album is getting uh, prepped? Yeah, I'll never say never. I mean, well, the Say Delan, never say never. We'll probably do another one one day. Okay. Um, the thing is with Say Delan is that that was me and Belinda's escapism from, you know, that's basically that started because we wanted to do some music together. We didn't want to bring our relationship in the CBP. Right. <laughs> um, so, so now the CBP is kind of, Sadalan has been engulfed within CBP now. So that makes more sense but, with that little EP that you guys, that single that you had done with Echoes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. That basically, because it's the same people. And weirdly, the, the World War thing, it's the same people, you know. It's, well, same people. It's me and Belinda. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> You know, yes, we're okay. talking about doing doing a recording and an album and everything. We just wow. re-recorded one of those songs. I can't say too much about that either. <laughs> but it has it has a couple of interesting people on it. And oh, cool. So I think we're going to do more World War because it's so different. You know, from it's, from CBP, it's not like CBP is not going to go in that direction. Right? Yeah, that sounds a lot more like but, Iron Monkey. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like it's sort of grungy noise rock mixed with black metal somehow. You know? Yeah. 
but it's just it's another bunch of our influences and this kind of music that we want to make but it doesn't fit into cbp albums right you know, it doesn't fit into the cbp world so we, we will do that separately and i think world war the name i think it's going to be called the uvo instead oh, wow. of world war I think we're changing the name, you know, and the UVO stands for the Universal Vigilante Order. Oh, wow, man. So, so it's pretty hardcore stuff, you know. That's pretty wild. So, all right, so speaking of names, and I'll wrap this up for now. I know you didn't intend to spend your entire afternoon with me, but how did you, how, where did you? No, I'm all right, man. There's no stress today. Oh, good. Where did you come up with the name Cripple Black Phoenix? Uh, well, that was, that. It was actually a lyric from a Nine Monkey song. Ah, okay. Some of those vocals are a little hard to understand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, you definitely need the lyric sheet, and even yeah. then it doesn't make sense, yeah. <laughs> we, had, we just had a laugh doing uh, Nine Monkey songs. Um, some of them were just done by, like, we'd just write things down, uh, you know, separately, and then just <laughs> take, take a turn, you know what I mean? Um I can remember doing that with, with Jim and, and with Johnny as well, because we all lived in the same flat, you know. It's like the monkey gram, you know, the pentagram with the monkey's face? Yeah. <laughs> that, that basically, that was Jim just cutting out monkey faces and putting it in the pentagram, and we were just sat there laughing our heads off, going, look at that. <laughs> and then, you know, that's that band all together. But um, <laughs> you know, Cripple Black Phoenix, the, the actual full line was Cripple Black Phoenix never fed. It oh. was a random line. Is a random line in in a song. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Wow. And I just, yeah. I mean, I I didn't write the line. I can't remember who did, to be honest. But I always felt like I was connected with it. I just loved that line. And I did, I did for a short while. I, I I released a couple of CDs on the label. I did at Plastic Head called Black Phoenix. Oh, okay. Uh, Look on the Teeth of Lines album. I'm credited instead of my name. It says Cripple Black Phoenix drums. Oh, does it? I didn't notice that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> and I think it was after that. It was it was when we we when I was doing the first Cripple Black Phoenix demos. At the same time, when we were talking about maybe doing another Teeth of Lines album, we decided not to do that. And then I basically wanted to come. I took the what my pseudonym from the album so i was known as cripple black phoenix for playing drums on the album <laughs> so i took that on and, and gave it to the band that i was going to do you know wow oh that's really cool that's the story but uh, yeah uh, but the thing is with 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 cripple black phoenix the name is like art in, you know life imitating art the, the name actually makes more sense now it's come to mean something now yeah you know it's like the it's like you can look at it as like the death of something immortal, but then again you look at it as like something that never dies, even though, you know, obviously crippled, burnt to chard, but it's the phoenix. It's a it phoenix. always comes back. I think now with the history of the band and the and the, all the bullshit that we've been through and the near endings of the band so many times, it means so much now. Well, that and and you personally, I mean, you know, you, you survived a stroke, pneumonia. A two-day mm. coma, car accidents, friends passing, and here you, you still are. The music always sounds hopeful and positive. Yeah. I think the the worst the worst things I've been through is when people have tried to steal the band away from me. Well, yeah, that's you know, and that's twice now. It's happened twice. Twice, you know, um, and and uh, oh. they're the, they're the hardest things I've had to go through. So, but we're still here, you know. Yeah, well, because that's you know beyond stroke pneumonia those are medical things car accidents mm. that those are accidents but when somebody betrays that's a betrayal and that's yeah I and mean, it's, it's the mental health aspect of it as well yeah. because that, that really affects you mentally and it's nothing nothing physical you know it physical does. is you know whatever broken bones whatever it all heals but mental health is not so good to fix yeah and i, I see music as basically the the bottom line really there's there's two reasons why I do Cripple Black Phoenix. One is that when I want to hear music that doesn't exist, I'll make it myself. That's awesome. That's the fundamental creativity side of it. Secondly, is I need to do it because it's my therapy. And if I don't, I'm gonna end up jumping off a fucking bridge or something. That's the that's just the reality wow. of it. It's I'm not trying to be like, you know, no sympathy, don't want to, nothing, nothing, not you know, yeah. I, that's why that's why songs have hope in them, you know. 
yes, it's miserable music sometimes and we talk about some pretty dark things. Not one Cripple Black Phoenix album leaves you feeling miserable. I don't think. I know. Because when you feel like that yourself, the last thing you want to do is sing about it and play songs about it, you know? Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I like dark music and everything, you know? I find it quite uplifting and everything. So, yeah, that, that's part of Cripple Black Phoenix, but we're not a dark band, you know? It can also be nice cathartic to play it. I mean, I, you know, yeah, I mean... And hear it. I can't be dealing with it. Like, everything has to be dark this and dark that and cult this and... If you're dictating what I got to do, I'm going to go against it anyway. Yeah, well, yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately for me, <laughs> I think I'm just predisposed to be that kind of person. Yeah. And, I, and I, I swear to God, you know, I didn't do well at school because I rebelled. And, I, you know, I've never had like a steady career job because I've wanted to do my own thing all my life, you know. And, yeah. But it makes your life shit as well. Yeah. You know, it's not... And I, I kind of wish that I was like a normal person that went and went to college and got a good education and got a good job and got married and had a house and all that kind of stuff and has a good income. And sometimes I wish I was like that because that's, you know, you're secure. Sa- yeah, there's I've a safety never, in it. I, yeah, I've never had a secure life. I've yeah. never had that security. But you make amazing um, art. Eh, but, you know. I think so. I need to do it. That's That's the only thing, you know. Yeah. And... Don't get me wrong, I, I really appreciate you saying that, and I appreciate everybody who likes what I do. Of course I do. Yeah. You know, because it's nice for my ego. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but at the same time, it's, it's uh, when you have validation that other people maybe think the same, then it really helps mentally. When I have guests like you on it, that for, of, of bands that I've been listening to for a long time, I, I just, I, I don't know, I can't be encouraging enough to just continue making more because it means a lot to, to me personally and to a lot of the other fans. So, you know, it's, it's not condescension or I'm not even uh, trying to be a, you know, an overly big fanboy or anything. I'm just, I'm just trying well, to can, encourage the art itself. And you, you know, I can't say how much that like, I appreciate it and other people in my position that appreciate people like you as well, you know, Really, honestly, it's because uh, it has to go both ways. One can't exist without the other, you know. Exactly. Um, and we've just got to appreciate that, you know. The other thing is that, I mean, now, uh, I mean, I've got to give a shout out to, or, you know, I mean, there's Belinda and there's Helen and there's Andy and there's Joel, you know. We're all sort of part of this now. And after the last kind of round of people using the band for their own gain, you know, mm-hmm. which was quite recently, the whole vibe is kind of changed now you know wow. so we've built it so so now you know the whole kind of the the mental game i mean it's still going on a little bit but at the same time i've never felt so secure with the band as i do now you know uh, because of that core group the, the core group yeah and and there's things that have happened amongst us behind the scenes yeah that have made us very very tight and you know it's very hard to trust people in this business but i trust these guys you know they've really kind of, I'm not, it's the wrong thing to say to sort of, they've proven themselves, you know, but they've proven to, I, I don't trust people very easily nowadays and I trust these guys. So there is something, something's happened there, you know, That's awesome. and I think the band, like a, a big corner has been turned, you know? So I think throughout the whole these years, every couple of years, I will be on the verge of packing it in and saying, that's it. I'm not doing it anymore. Now I can see it's not going to be the next within the next two years, <laughs> maybe five. <Yeah. laughs> it's better, you know. That's, that is, yeah, you're stretching it out a bit. That's good. It's a gain, yeah, it's a gain. So, when is uh, the new album yeah. set to come out? Uh, well, we wanted it to be the before the end of the year, but the thing is, the pressing plants have got so many delays oh. with the with the you know the the, the core the the core materials. So even if we, I mean, if we ordered the vinyl straight after the recording session back in whenever it was, April, May, they still wouldn't have been able to deliver until next year. Wow. There's a huge delay. Yeah. We're hoping that it's going to be, we're hoping that we can still have January, February. Okay. You know, I think we want to get it out as soon as possible because, you know, we've got the single, yeah, but, you know, new singer and everything. And we want the album out before any of the next proper tour that we do 
Okay. And oh, hey. I mean, that's a whole nother subject touring, but um, yeah, I wanted to hopefully, ask about that. hopefully, fingers crossed, we can tour next year, you know. And so the, the new thing, that's the uh, Painful Reminder single, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, that is a... uh, another, another cover version. Yeah. <laughs> I was listening to that a bunch yesterday at work and it's just fantastic. And I love the artwork on it too. That, that Rose is just beautiful. Oh, you know what? I said Vigilante was the only one I've done. I, I did that one too. Oh, really? <laughs> that is getting <laughs> <laughs> validation right there. That's just... <laughs> <laughs> oh man. No, yeah, that's, that was, uh, yeah, that's, but the, the song itself and everything, you know, I mean, it was weird because it'd been on my short list of cover versions to do anyway, because, you know, I've got a soft spot for um, SNFU and Chai Pig. And, and then he passed away last year. And, and, oh, uh, I didn't it, yeah, and that's why we did it in the way that we did and presented it the way we did. Oh, okay. Um, it kind of, it turned into a tribute to him. So it was the right time to put it out. And uh, yeah, right, there you go. So touring, and uh, I promise we'll wrap up here. I've, I've kept you forever at this point, but when you're writing songs, is there uh, an idea of having to play them a lot, to, to play them in the studios in a way that you can translate that to a live setting? Or are you having to go back and rearrange things to be able to play them live? Yeah. Uh, we've done a lot of songs that I neglected to think about playing. Them. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, to, to our detriment. So when we, play, <laughs> when we play live, I believe that we should stick to our strengths <laughs> <laughs> because as much as I'd love to play something like Baston blues live, we will never do it justice because the recorded version of it has got such a vibe and it's got the strings and it's so layered. We're not going to do it unless we go on tour with an orchestra. Right. We're not going to get the same vibe. That's true. You know, that, yeah. I'd, ra I'd rather leave it alone and let the listener appreciate it for what it is. You know, that makes sense. Um, because I'm not about to go on tour and play the greatest hits, you know? Right. So we have tried to play those kind of songs um, live. We've, we've done it a few times with things like um, Scared and Alone or, or uh, something off, what was it? Off, not Operation Mince Meat. There's another one. Get Down and Live With It off Crafty Ape. Oh, okay. There, there was, there's been songs that we tried because we really wanted to play them and we wanted to present something to the fans that they had not heard us play before. And they just didn't, it just, we could play it note perfect, yeah. but it's, it would sound shit because live, it did, it just, it's a vibe thing. It didn't have the same vibe. Okay. So we're a rock and roll band and at the end of the day, you know, and we put on rock and roll shows and we tend to stick to the, the songs that work live, you know? Yeah. Is it hard so, to put a, a set list together at this point with so much stuff? And, and so, you know, your songs are so, some of them are so long. It's hundreds of them as well now, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's hard for me because I, I, I tend to pick my favorites, which isn't everyone else's favorite. So, <laughs> uh, the, there's obviously, the, there's a group of songs that I think we'd get lynched if we didn't play. Like, like we've forgotten, we've forgotten, who, forgotten we who we are. Yeah. <laughs> Burn Reynolds, 444. There's probably another you know, People always want to hear Fantastic Justice or something like that. Uh, or, oh, yeah. But so we tend to play maybe one or two of those. I mean, we've forgotten who we are. We've probably played it every single show since 2009, you know? Oh, boy. Well, I mean, so, it's, it's a great track. It's, it's one that, that it's definitely a standard. And that's the thing that an album like that is just, it, it's hard to leave anything off like of a lifetime is one of my favorite tracks that that 
Oh yeah, You've yeah, done, the journey I, cover. I love that. The way you guys did that is just amazing. I mean, the trouble with Ivy Vigilante is that I'm I'm not I didn't really like the the, the drums on it because the, the sound of the drums it's they sound like a demo or something. It's just not kind of, it's it, it basically it didn't come up to what I wanted it to be. But it's that you know it's like it's not my favorite album. I think it's got some of the best songs on it. But um, I mean, some of the best songs. I really like Troublemaker and I really like I really like We Forgotten Who We Are, um, which is great because. I, I don't get bored of playing that one, which is kind of lucky. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I get bored of playing Burton Reynolds, and I've, you know. But... <laughs> Which is why I would probably still play it. I mean, my, my least favorite album actually is Crafty Ape because it's it's produced too well. It sounds too good. Oh, wow. It's got no way, there's no edge to it. It's all, everything's too nice, you know? <laughs> oh, wow, uh, okay. Um, so uh, I find it really boring. It's a boring album for me. Wow. I didn't feel that way at the time. I'll stand by it, you know? I'll stand by everything that we've done. Oh, um, yeah. But, but I think that's date, that, that album's dated for me, you know. Okay. Bronze. Is... Like Vigilante doesn't date, you know. No. That's the good thing about that album. I don't really like the production, but, you know, it's what we had to work with. But it, at least it doesn't date. I think my favorite probably is No Sadness or Farewell. Yeah. Oh, God, that, yeah. You know, because it's, it's a weird album, but it's got some of my favorite things on it, you know. I'm trying to pull some of these up because I listen to a lot of stuff while I'm at there's work. So much, you know, there's, a, there's a lot to get through. Oh, that, that really is. And when I listen to it at work, I can't always look at the track listing. So some of the yeah. stuff I've been listening to for a while, I just, I just you know, don't know the You names. know what? But you don't even have to explain because, I mean, I don't know the names of songs on some of my favorite albums. I See, I feel bad when I do that, though, because when I was a kid and I had all the time in the world, I could put on an album, I could sit on my bed and I could just read liner notes, read lyrics and do, and yeah. I knew everything. Yeah. And now I'm just like, Oh yeah, I like yeah. that. I don't remember what song it is. I don't remember what album it's on. I don't remember what track yeah. number it is. It's weird. Isn't it? I think we all, we all go through the same thing, but yeah. Um, I wish I did like, like I mean, I, w I really wish that I could remember song titles. It's just, I forget. Yeah. I forget them. It's, it's ironic really into because I'm so fussy about my own band <laughs> because I'm, I'm so, <laughs> I'm so picky and meticulous about giving the songs their titles. Yeah. And I make such, but I even make the point. I'm always making the point about it. Like I give the songs their titles. <laughs> and, right? and then I don't care. And then I don't care about other people's song titles. I mean, come on. I'm a fucking <laughs> asshole, really. <but laughs> it, does the new album have a title yet? Speaking of titles. It or does. I'm allowed to tell you right now. I think I, I don't even know. 
I have no idea at this point. <laughs> I, I mean, personally, I don't care. I just don't want to piss off management or the label or anything. No, the, the, the album's called Bane Fire. It's spelt B-A-N-E. Okay. F Y R E. Oh, cool. Right. So it's old English. Yeah. Um, it's an old English spelling of the word bone fire. Oh, wow. And bone fire is the origin of bonfire. I didn't know that. Yeah. Man. That, so that, that's, what, that's what the album's called. And the bane fire, the, the origin of it, the, the, the whole thing that the, they used to call bone fire, of course, you know, yeah. burning of bones. The Bonfire, it basically connects with when people were burned for being different. Uh, when okay. people were persecuted for being different. It's all about being outcasts. Uh, so, uh, a lot of the album is about being outcasts. Uh, um, if it, there's an outcast cover on this album, I don't know. I mean... That, <laughs> oh, the band Outcast. Yeah. That... <laughs> Are you talking about the New York hardcore band Outcast? No, <laughs> I was thinking of the uh, Andre Three Thousand Outcast. <laughs> <laughs> I would see Cripple Black Phoenix doing a cover of Hey Ya would be crazy. Yeah, <laughs> oh maybe who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I've got I've got some stranger ideas in my head. <laughs> 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 well, we did that. We, we did a Ricky Nelson song. You know what I mean? It's about people being persecuted. It's about rebelling against being persecuted. Wow. It's about turning the tables. It's about retribution against people who persecute other people. So um, not only do the bon the bonfire thing, it's about burning people for div being different. It's also about burning the people who control you. It's burning the politicians. It's burning the, the parliament down. It's burning Congress down, you know? I think this is a very uh, well-timed release yeah <laughs> it's very raw it's very emotional i'm excited because going back and listening to some of the albums i haven't heard in a while and some that i wasn't really familiar with at all it's just really reminded me how much i enjoy your music and and oh, how, thanks, man. and how much much of it i'm missing that i'm going to have to get because <laughs> i didn't realize you know all the singles and eps and things and, and compilations so i'm gonna have to step up my game here and go pick a few things up that I'm missing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, um, some of the, some of the albums are pretty hard to get, but let me know what you need because I mean, I don't have much here, but I, I do have a few extra copies of things knocking about. So you never know. Oh, yeah, I might have some, I'm happy to help. I will have to trade you something like, uh, maybe a photo you can use in the artwork or, or a coffee, a podcast coffee mug or something. I do have shower curtains. If you know curtains, if you need a, if you need a shower curtain with my podcast logo on it, I can hook you up. Seriously. You do shower curtains. Yes. I'll, I'll, wow, that's crazy. I, will, I don't uh, have. I have a. I have a, gl a glass door, but um, <laughs> I, Belinda uses shower curtains. Uh, uh, her, her apartment in uh, Stockholm. I will. Uh, I'll forward you a photo of it. It's hilarious. It's. I don't know if you saw the the logo itself. It's just a big like sweaty microphone. When it's like performance anxiety, <laughs> like 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 the old radio microphones would say that this radio station's name in an arc, it says performance oh, yeah, anxiety. Yeah, 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 no, the, yeah. I will send you a picture of it because it's freaking hilarious, and oh. nobody's nobody's bought one yet, so. Oh, come on! I mean, what's not to love? <laughs> I know it's great. Who wouldn't want performance anxiety on their shower in the morning? Yeah, first thing. I in love the that. I love, I love the podcast name, performance anxiety. Well, like. I think I think me and Belinda both relate to that I, a lot. The the one right. of the coolest parts is that my logo was actually done by this guy named Mark Dancy. And he mm. was in a band called Big Chief back in the nineties. And I, I remember had, Big Chief. You remember Big Chief? Yeah, from Detroit. They yeah, were yeah. Awesome. So Mark Dancy was like episode number two. And he actually ended up doing the logo for Soundgarden's Bad Motor Finger album. 
So, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. So I said, how much would you charge to do a logo for me? So he, he gave me yeah. some ridiculously low figure. And I'm like, okay, do it. Let's, let's do it. Oh, wow. So Excellent. So uh, I, the guy who did my logo was done by the same guy who did Soundgarden's logo. So nice, very cool. <laughs> so that 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 makes me happy. Yeah. And I've had a few people say you need to update it. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if I can nah, at this point. Nah. No. I kind of like the, yeah. I kind of like having that connection. Yeah, exactly. Just <laughs> well, because something doesn't make it better anyway. So exactly, exactly. So, well, <laughs> look, man, I appreciate you spending so much time with me. I know you've got other things to do today, but thank you so much for all your time. I'm all right. I've, I've already done all my chores and everything. So before I let you go, I almost forgot. Is there uh, what's the best way for people to to keep tabs on the band and find out releases and tours and where do they find that information? I mean, I guess the, the most relevant places is, is Instagram and Facebook. Okay. Um, I think they're, they're the ones that probably just, you know, because they're, because they're interactive, they're, they're, they're always up to date and stuff. So Excellent. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, just, you, you, I mean, it's not difficult to find the band on right. Facebook or Instagram. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I guess that's the, that's the, the right way. So Awesome. Well, and I thank you so much. And I, I've, I've Appreciate your time, and it's been so much fun talking to you and getting to know you. Yeah, uh, cool, man. Yeah, it's really, really enjoyable. 